I repeat, I'm very honored to be part of this lecture series in linear dynamics, which is an excellent and very nice initiative that uh, is running now online since long time. Today, I would like to present you a few results concerning structure and dynamics of networks where interactions between the element of the networks are beyond uh, pairwise interactions, that is, are interaction involving groups of nodes in the network, uh, group interactions. And I like to start this uh, presentation that this is, as you see, uh, collects several results which are very recent, as you will see, it's last, last year, last two years, of a very large group of collaborators, including people from Spain, like Miguel Romance, Irene Sendinia Nadal, Italy, like Ginestra Bianconi, Chile, Karin Alfano Bittner, a uh, group, I repeat, in, in Spain. There are people like Vito Latora, who are very important in the area of uh, complex networks, so Yamir Moreno. And also people that are based in Russia, China, and also uh, recently, several collaboration with Indian people. Uh, I like to start this uh, uh, this presentation saying that in physics, you can make a rough classification of systems into two big categories. There are the continuous systems, which are those which are modeled by partial differential equations. So you have, for example, fluids. You can model them by partial differential equations, and then you can treat instabilities in these systems, pattern formation, pattern competition, turbulence, and so on and so forth. There is a very rich and very important class of complex phenomena taking place in this kind of systems. These are the continuous systems. Then, as opposed to the continuous systems, you have the distributed systems. Distributed systems are those systems which you may see as formed by a, a, a huge number of components. So these are systems distributed indeed, uh, where uh, you have such big, huge number of components, and where the complexity emerge as a collective dynamics, a collective organization of such uh, unitary components. So in the last 20 years, there was a uh, the birth and development of a movement called network science because uh, this was uh, a, a, an attempt to uh, um, represent these distributed systems as networks where the unitary components are the nodes and where the links of the network represent the interactions between these these elements and therefore there was very successful, I would say, very prolific area of research, very interdisciplinary area of research, in which the main questions are how to describe the emergent property, the emergent functions, the emergent dynamics, the emergent complexity of these systems in terms of the interaction between the components of the system itself. Now, you understand that this is a few examples, are the brain, internet, and so on and so forth. You understand very well, however, that when you do such a representation, uh, you are making a very strong assumption. And this assumption is uh, that it's written here. Um, you imagine that the overall interplay among one unitary component of a system and the other system and the rest of the system can be always written as combinations of pairwise interactions, because a link is a pairwise interaction, is an interaction between two elements of the network. Now, this is always true, for example, when uh, you have linear interactions. For example, if you have diffusion, diffusion can be always written as a linear uh, function of the state of the two nodes. And when the the interaction is linear, you have the superposition uh, of the effect, so you can always factorize interaction we are, which are three body, four body, five body into uh, the corresponding two body interactions. But when you have 
interactions, which are inherently nonlinear, for example, in the brain, then this factorization not always is guaranteed. So the hypothesis is short in representing faithfully the interactions inside the network. And you have, therefore, to consider structures which in glow, which represent group interaction that you cannot factorize into link interaction. Uh, I make you two examples. For example, let's consider co-authorship networks in which nodes are the scientists. Now, you see that here you, I'm considering three scientists, I, J, and K. So you, you may have a situation in which uh, the scientists I and J are publishing a paper together without having scientist K as an author. Then you have another paper published by J and K without I, and a third paper published by I and K without J. This is a triangle. This is a three-body interaction. It means that I, J, and K, us authors, have interacted among them. But this is a, a factorizable triangle because there are three different papers. So the interaction occurred by means of three different papers. A completely different situation is when node I, scientist I, scientist J and the scientist K together are publishing a paper. So now there are not three papers, there is only one paper which is signed by the three of them. So this group interaction is uh, different from the previous one because you cannot factorize it in the as the sum of the three of the three of the three links. Another example in ecology is shown down. Uh, you can have uh, imagine nodes as uh, ecological species, and then you may have the normal interaction between species, but you can have also the situation here, B, in which species 3 is not directly interacting with species 1, but is interacting with the interaction between 1 and 2. So species 3, in this case, is acting as a catalyst is a catalyzer of the interaction between one and three. So this interaction, therefore, between one and two is mediated by node three. And this mediation cannot be factorized in link because there is not a link between node three and node i. So you have to consider this mediation, this catalyzation as a three-body interaction, a pure three-body interaction. So, uh, this means uh, that in terms, instead of having a normal uh, matrix representation of networks, because usually when you have a network you and you have only pairwise interaction, you have an adjacency matrix, a matrix whose elements are 0 and 1 if you have a link or you don't have a link, and by means of the adjacency matrix you can define the degree of a node i as the number of connection this node i has with other nodes in the network. You have to pass to a simplicia representation or hypergraph representation in which there are no adjacency metrics, but there are adjacency tensors, because you have to consider this group interaction, this hyperlink that uh, have more than two nodes inside, so you need uh, tensors. You need to generalize the degree of node i, uh, which is now the sum over all the dimension of the tensor of the elements of such tensors. You can generalize the degree, as we will see momentarily, of a link. So you can calculate the number of either link which simultaneously contain node i and node j. And then you can generalize the concept of Laplacian matrix, that is at each order of interaction d, you have a corresponding Laplacian matrix of order D, which is a function of this generalized degree and the generalized degree of the link. Now, uh, when you have such a representation, when you have such a representation, um, you start now discussing, I want to discuss with you a few issues. One issue is, for example, structural. So there are some structural quantities that 
usually characterized network that needs to be generalized and redefined. And others are instead um, dynamics. One can imagine that such higher order interactions that you introduce in the networks are producing richer dynamics, which in general cannot be produced by simple pairwise interactions. So let me start with uh, uh, issues. Probably one of the most important uh, uh, question in a network is uh, having a ranking of the importance of the nodes in the system. So you have a system composed by nodes, that is unitary component, and you want to understand how these components are important. Imagine, for example, uh, you have protein-protein interaction network, and you want to rank the importance of proteins because, uh, for, for, for example, facilitating a given function of the cell. Or in genetic networks, you want to have rank the importance of a given gene for a given disease. Or imagine Google, the internet, uh, what is doing is ranking web pages so as when you make a search it gives you uh, information in the right uh, ranking of importance it's very important to understand very relevant to understand that the correct question one has to ask is not how central how important is a given node in a given network but rather how central is a given node in a given network with respect to a given process because a given network can host different processes in a simultaneous way. So you can have different processes that occur in a network in parallel. And you may have one node which is very important for one process, but not necessarily so important uh, with respect to another process. So the way we consider, we represent the four networks with high order interactions is a collection of nodes you see here, and a collection of hyperlinks. You see, you have a group interaction, three body interaction between node one, two, three, another three body interaction between node two, four, five, where you have two body interaction between four, five, and you have a four body interaction between one, two, three, and four. And you, this is the general way. Now, you can imagine that different processes take place on this at different order of interaction and therefore the issue is okay, that i have to pass from uh, a scalar this could be sorry uh, excuse me um can, is it possible to hide this green uh, dialog thing uh, green because we are not able to see the slide yeah yeah is it possible to hide that yeah no it's not oh, possible okay. because uh, yeah i will i can put this this way okay thank you Professor. thank you so uh, this uh, can be done by, uh, sorry, this can be done by uh, uh, abandoning the idea that you have to assign a scalar value to a node as a centrality, and imagine that you have to define instead a vector centrality. That is, each node will have a vector, vector centrality, uh, whose first component will be the importance of the node with respect to two-body interaction, to normal links. Second component of this vector will be the imp how important it will measure how important is this node with respect to three-body interaction. Third component will be four-body interaction. So the number of components of this vector will be exactly d minus one, where d is the maximal order of interactions in a graph. So how can we solve the assignment of this uh, centrality in the following way? You have this hyperlink and you associate to the hyperlink the corresponding line graph. The line graph is a normal graph. Now it's a network, it's not a hyper network. It's a network having as nodes the hyperlinks of the hyper graph. So you see you have here the interaction between 4, 5, and here you have the node 4, 5. Here you have interaction 2, 4, 5, and you have the node 2, 4, 5. So the line graph contains as nodes the hyperlinks of the previous. And these nodes are connected if there is a, an overlap between the corresponding hyperlinks. So, for example, nodes 1, to the hyperlink, the green hyperlink 1, 2, 3, and the 
brown hyperlink for five, they don't have an interaction. And therefore, there is no link between these two nodes. And all other hyperlinks, they are having an overlap. And so you have the other links. It's easy to show that if the original hypergraph is connected, the line graph is connected. If the original hypergraph is symmetric, the line graph is symmetric. So now you have a symmetric graph and you have then the frobenius Perron theorem that ensure the existence and uniqueness of the eigenvector centrality of the line graph. So you have for each node of the line graph, which means each hyperlink of the original hypergraph, you have one value, one scalar value. And therefore, by using this scalar value, you can uniquely construct uh, the different components of the vector centrality in the following way. Take node i, component k of node i is 1 divided by k, the sum of the values of the centrality, the eigenvector centrality of those hyperlink H, which have sides K, you see, the norm of H is equal to K, and contain node I. So you sum up the values that you obtain on the line graph, and you obtain the different components of this vector centrality. And therefore, having now a vector for each node, you may have different rankings. For example, you can rank the importance of a node with respect to its first component, with respect to its second component. So you have different rankings. And as you see, in important application, this ranking may be very different. For example, in the collaboration network, you can take archive in mathematics and you have a big, huge hypergraph formed by half a million papers which are written by 230,000 authors in mathematics. The maximum co-authorship is 66, so you have vectors of dimension 66. You can now rank these authors, and you now ask, if I take, for example, the top 100 scientists in the list, in the ranking with respect to the first component, and compare this list with the top 100 scientists, in the ranking with respect to another component, are these lists equal? Are these lists overlapping? Or in other words, if I am very famous scientist with, with respect to uh, interactions with three or four, are also, am I also a very famous uh, scientist with respect to interaction among 50 others? And the answer is no, because you see here is the matrix of the overlap and you see that in general all the elements outside the diagonal eh, are very small so it means that in general if you find a scientist which is very famous for papers written on a given number of authors this uh, scientist is not necessarily central with respect to different sizes of of co-authorship collaboration. It means that we as scientists, especially mathematicians, tend to uh, find us comfortable with a limited number of uh, collaborators and uh, to select very well our collaborator. There are other cases in which instead there is important overlaps, like in commercial drugs or in leadership in social uh, networks. So you understand that uh, with uh, the definition of this uh, vector centrality, you are offering much more information on the, uh, on the node because you can distinguish cases in which the hypergraph and the interactions are uh, of one nature and uh, uh, situations in which the interaction instead are of different natures. Okay, so this is a, a structural issue. The next problem we want to solve is instead the dynamics. And the first and the simplest, prob probably dynamics process, is an evolutionary game. So if you have a two agent to strategy games, usually you have a payoff matrix, because two strategy means that each agent can be cooperator or defector. And uh, you uh, define the interactions between cooperators and defectors by means of this payoff matrix, which tells you how much a cooperator earns 
when it meets another cooperator or when it meets a defector and how much a defector earns when it meets a cooperator or a defector. A game is very simple. You adopt one of these strategies, you play the game, you collect your payoff, and then you have to decide the next iteration of the game. And usually one strategy is by imitation. So each node looks at its specific neighborhood and try to imitate the node which had the maximum payoff. So the, max, the most successful. How we do this? One calculate the payoff, which node try to imitate with the given probability. They a neighbor with the highest total payoff. And that probability is usually taken as the Fermi rule. What we have here is that if you parameterize the payoff matrix by means of these two parameters S and T, you can show, you can uh, basically uh, obtain the four most important evolutionary gains. The most famous one is the prisoner dilemma, which occur for t larger than one and s smaller than zero. But then you can have harmony game, and the snow drift game, and the staggered game. These games have completely different Nash equilibria. You know that when you play one of such game, you start from initial condition, you obtain a final asymptotic equilibria, which is the Nash equilibrium. And, uh, for example, it's very well known that the Nash equilibrium for prisoner dilemma is everybody has to uh, defect. For harmony game, everybody has to cooperate. And for the other two, Snow Drift and Stagant, you have this mixed equilibrium. But in general, the idea of such evolutionary games that you start from initial condition, and then you obtain an equilibrium, and starting from that moment, the uh, situation is frozen. You cannot change strategy because you are at the equilibrium. Uh, what happens when you include more than two body interactions? When you include more than two body interaction, you have then to distinguish between the situation in which the triangle is the factorizable in the tree link or not. In one case, you say, OK, I, if this is the situation, I adopt values T1 and S1 and play game one. In this other case, the payoff between i and j must depend explicitly on k. And in order to do this, what you generally do is a possibility is, OK, you look at the strategy SKI and SKJ that node k is doing with i and j. If these strategies are equal, then you play game two, which means you adopt values t2 and s2. If these strategies, these two strategies, are different instead, then you play game three. That is, you adopt values T3 and S3. Now, how you calculate payoff? You let uh, the game uh, play a given strategy, and the payoff of node i will be one over the degree of node i, the sum over all the links of node i, all connections formed by node i of the payoff that node i is making on link ij. So sum over j of this. On its turn, the payoff that node i is doing on link ij will be 1 divided by the generalized degree of this link ij times the sum over all triangles tau which are formed by link ij of payoff that node i is making in the link ij with respect to triangle tau. And now you have to distinguish if triangle tau is empty, and then you have game one, or triangle tau is filled, and then you may have game two or game three. It's clear, no? So you pass from evolutionary processes in networks to evolutionary processes in network with higher order. Uh, interaction with three body interactions. Now, we can, we, to simplify this, the things, what you can do, you can take game one equal to game three and to change game two. Doing so, you can put in competition all possible pair of evolutionary, classical evolutionary games. So, here you have columns of these in which you represent the harmony game, the stagang, this game one. 
the snowdrift and prisoner dilemma and changing t2 at very at different values of s2 means putting in competition this h with any other of the other so for example this h here is put in competition with uh, 42 larger than one with another a uh, with uh, with another with uh, sorry with prisoner dilemma with in this area with sd in this area with sh in this area with st and the same all the rest moreover what you can do you can take a network made of all triangles and uh, every parameter row uh, which is uh, this parameter which tells you the density of filled triangle so if rho is equal to zero all the triangles are factorized so you don't have three body interactions you have only links if rho is equal to one you have all three body interactions you don't have links and in the middle you have two body interaction and three body interactions at the same time uh, in the network now you see immediately that you have two new things first of all as a function of rho which is as a function of this new variable as a function of the relative size of three body interactions with respect to two body interactions what you always have is a transition from cooperation to defection or from defection to cooperation in the figure blue means defection sorry blue means uh, uh, see blue means defection and red means co cooperation so in harmony game at the beginning when rho is equal to zero you know the nash equilibrium is all cooperation but then when you increase rho you pass to have all defection and uh, staccato game is the same and here you have in the prison at the end, the opposite you start from full defection and you get into full cooperation so it means that the nature of the connection is the uh, fact that you have three body interactions changes the state of the Nash equilibrium and this is already an important result because it means that depending on the particular kind of interaction you may have one equilibrium or another equilibrium but the most interesting thing is another one is that if you go in the area close by to this transition you have the emergence of a completely new state which is an asymptotic not stationary state you see here you have uh, an asymptotic stationary state a frozen state everybody is cooperating or everybody is defecting here instead <clears throat> you have an asymptotic state in which still each element is free of changing in time its uh, um, strategy so you have the alternation forever of period in which cooperation is larger than defection here you have the number of cooperators and the number of defectors as a function of time so this is a large period for example in which uh, the majority of nodes in the network are cooperating but then immediately after you have a period in which red uh, black is larger than uh, um, red that is now instead the majority of agent is defecting and this is a continuous alternation is lasting forever so you have a completely new things which is an asymptotic non-stationary state and it's completely different from a nash equilibrium because a nash equilibrium is frozen and it's much more you see uh, uh, pertinent to what is reality because in real interactions you have the two people cooperate because they are friends then there is a clash between them and they start to defect and then there is peace between them and then cooperate again you know this is uh, things that uh, uh, sorry um so this is uh, the, the 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 new things and i uh, refer to this uh, paper which just this one year ago uh, in which we described this new dynamics that cannot occur i repeat in two body interactions because you have a nash equilibrium a frozen equilibrium and this is uh, completely rich and new dynamics that is entirely due to three body interactions 
Next step, uh, instead of games, uh, we go to dynamics. So now the network is therefore made of dynamical states. Each dynamical state is represented by an n-dimensional vector. You have uh, a function which describes the dynamics of the unconnected nodes. For example, these are following uh, Hodgkin axley if they are neurons, or if they are oscillators, Kuramoto's, or if whatever you want. And then you have function which describes these multi-body interactions. Eh? So the general equations is the x, the t, the derivative in time of this n-dimensional vector is uh, the function f plus you have the pairwise interactions, which is a given value of coupling strength sigma one times the sum over the line of uh, a adhesion symmetrics times the a function G1, which describes two body interaction. Then you have the three body interaction is sigma two, double sum, elements of a tensor, three body interaction. Then you have four body interaction, five body interaction up to one unit. And we published recently a nature communication paper in which we solved rigorously this very general equation, which is valid for whatever dynamical systems and whatever structure of interaction at any level, by noticing the following. I'm not going into the details. I repeat, if you want to have the details, let's go uh, I'm to that paper. The idea is that when, as long as all the coupling functions are synchronization and invasive, that is, are such, if you put all the arguments equal to each other, you get zero. Then you can prove then the synchronization solution x1 equal to x2 equal to x3 exists as an invariant solution. It means exists and is the same for all the values of sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, sigma d, the coupling strain. Then you study the stability over there and you obtain the four values for the coefficients of the error. Hmm? which are functions of what? Of the eigenvalues lambda 1 of the Laplacian matrix and then of all the other Laplacian, generalized Laplacian matrix, each one at each level of the interaction. And now there is a big problem because these Laplacian matrices are not commuting, so they are not having the same a set of eigenvectors, therefore they are not having, they are not being diagonalized in the same way. But you can take a basis, you can make uh, a lot of algebra, and eventually you can obtain for uh, a unique variational function like this, which allows you to calculate a maximum Lyapunov exponent. So the transverse to the direction of uh, synchronization and then have, you see, for all possible non-linear interactions, you have different classes of uh, stability of the synchronized manifold. So I'm sorry, this I understand is a little bit harder to understand because it's uh, very dense, but for all details, please uh, let, if you are interested in this area, go in this uh, nature communication that we published recently. It's, uh, it was published in Nature Communication 12, page 1, 2021, because here there is the description, the rigorous treatment of uh, uh, interaction at any possible level. And you see that this is important because depending on the typical interaction, you may change the stability property. For example, if uh, for a three-dimensional system like the Rössler system or the Lorentz system, you take variable z uh, and you interact zj square, zk on variable y, uh, the system is never synchronizable. Instead, with the same situation, on the variable y, you put yj square yk you have a, a very wide range of synchronization and uh, then you have oscillatory uh, regimes in which you have a synchronization desynchronization resynchronization depending on whether the lambda max which is the maximum the upper exponent is positive or negative finally the last thing i want to discuss with you uh, and I have a few minutes, is uh, an extension of a very famous model, 
the Kuramoto model. Once again, to show you that considering higher order interaction introduced a completely different dynamics. So the original Kuramoto model, probably everybody of you knows, describes an ensemble of n globally coupled oscillators, where coupling is proportional to the sinus function of the phase difference. You have phase that i of the i oscillator, derivative in time is equal to given frequency omega i, plus <coughs> all to all coupling of sinus theta j minus theta i. Now you can make two extensions of this uh, things. The first extension is introducing higher order interaction, which is simple. You put instead of sinus theta j minus theta i, you put double sum jk sinus theta k plus theta j minus twice theta i. This corresponds to have sinus theta k minus theta i plus theta j minus theta i. But now sinus of a plus b is not sinus a plus sinus b. So you see, this interaction is non-linear, it cannot be factorized. Second extension, you can take the original equation and write this equation in the plane. So you introduce the vector sigma i, components cosine that i, sine that i, and write the equations for this vector. So you have d sigma i dt, an anti-symmetric matrix wi, and this is because the derivative of sinus is minus uh, cosinus, but the derivative of cosinus is minus sinus. And then you have, believe me, with a few trigonometrics, you can express this complicated sum as uh, the scalar product of this vector rho, which is the sum of all the vectors sigma i, on sigma i times sigma i rho minus times lambda, and lambda is the same lambda. Once you do this, you immediately realize that there is no reason why you have to limit yourself in two dimension. You can go in three dimension in the space, or in four dimension, in five dimension. The only important thing is that this vector sigma must have unitary measure, must have sides one. So you can describe with a single extended Kuramoto, therefore, not only points which are rotating in the unit circle in the plane, which is the normal Kuramoto, but you can, for example, describe the points which are moving on the surface of a sphere, of a unitary sphere, and therefore how the vectors align, which is for example, what happens uh, in flocking, you have the birds and the velocities of the birds in order for them to fly coherently, have to align in a space, in a three-dimensional space. Or you can describe in four dimensions points which are wandering eh, in the hypersurface of a, a unitary hypersphere, and so on and so forth. So you can have these two extensions, I mean, extension on the kind of uh, the uh, uh, interaction from two-body interaction to three-body interaction and extensions also on the side of the space where you are uh, considering your equations. Once you do this, you observe something really unbelievable. So uh, in here, you see, uh, I'm comparing the transition to synchronization. R is the famous Kuramoto order parameter. R equal to one means synchronization. R equal to zero means no synchronization. In the first row, you consider links, so two body interactions. In the second row, you consider three body interactions. First column, you consider D equal to two, so you are in a plane. Second, you are in the space, three dimension. You see, if you're normal Kuramoto, everybody knows normal Kuramoto, all to all connected, has a second order transition, continuous and reversible. You introduce now, you go to the second row, you go from D equal to two to D equal to three. So you pass from the plane to the space and this transition becomes suddenly discontinuous. Moreover, you introduce the three-body interaction and the continuous transition at d equal to, to 2 in the plane 
becomes discontinuous. And the discontinuous transition in the space becomes doubly discontinuous. But even more important is that this double discontinuity leave in the backward transition a state which is corresponding to R larger than zero at lambda smaller than zero. Now, if you look Kuramoto, you have to know that a necessary condition for synchronization, the Kuramoto model, is that at least a portion larger than a given threshold of the population must be positively coupled to the mean field. And here you have a case instead, a completely new different state, which emerge exclusively because of three body interactions and cannot emerge with two body interactions, is prohibited with two body interactions, in which you have partial coherence are larger than zero for negative coupling to the mean field. And this is valid for, you see, you can go to dimension D equal to 2, 4, 6, 8, or 3, 5, 7, 9, and you consistently see the same scenario. So odd and even dimension have different scenario, different synchronization scenario, and in even dimension you are left with this new, completely new state. And uh, we have published a physical review letter recently, a few months ago, this is the, the, the reference, contrarian synchronized beyond the limit of pairwise interaction, just to describe this new state, this, as you see, occur at negative lambda, which I repeat is a fully new phenomenology. It's a synchronization state that inherently cannot exist for two body interactions. And only because you have three body interactions, you have this state. And this state indeed correspond to a completely different state with respect to the phase locked state of Kuramoto. And we have described all the microscopic details of this, this state you find in this physical regulator papers. Okay, so I wanted not to enter into too much details, but I wanted to give you a flavor of the importance of considering such higher orders. Uh, interactions in networks, both from structural and from dynamical point of view. And here you find a, a large list of references, and you see classical references on synchronization, networks, and structural issues. And then you see all uh, what I described to you in this, uh, I mean, sort of um, panorama of things you find in paper of 2022, 2021, so very, very recent paper, which uh, are concerning structural issue processes and dynamics in hypergraph. Finally, I want to use uh, my last minute for thanking you for your patience and for inviting you to sub submit your best paper. We have a policy of maximum five papers per year per author to Chaos, Salt, and, and Fractals is a journal of Elsevier where I am editor in chief, uh, where there are many editors which are very famous in the area of nonlinear dynamics, networks like Yamir Moreno, Jose Mendes, Baruch Barzel, Cristina Massoyer, Marcel Clerc, Boris Malomed, Yuri Kifscher, and Gabriel Mindlin, among others. We have just obtained the release of the SciScore score 2021, which is incredibly high. We now are almost 10 and we are expecting this is the last year impact factor, but the impact factor 2021 will be released in a few days and it will be almost the same like the size score, which means that we will have impact factor 9.9, uh, 9.8, the same as physical review letter, it's really incredible. We are now number one journal in the international ranking of mathematical physics, number third, the third most important journal for statistical and nonlinear physics, journal number five in general mathematics, which is really incredible because you see you are number five of a long list of paper, 391, number 14 in applied mathematics and number 19 in general physics. So it's very, very well ranked. Uh, the paper has a 
tremendous visibility the journal. Uh, we receive more than 5,500 papers submitted each year, and we publish about a thousand papers, which means that we have a very, we are very selective. Uh, really, we have a very high quality paper. We have acceptance rates smaller than 20 percent. And what no more, not a lot of journals have, we have a tremendous visibility also in the internet. Uh, we have this year more than one million downloads per year from of the content of the journal from our web page. So please consider this journal as a venue in which you want maybe to the, disseminate your own research uh, to the community. Thank you a lot. And now I okay. interrupt yeah. the sharing and I'm ready to answer to any question you may have. Thank you, Professor. Now the seminar is open for questions, clarifications and suggestions. Questions, please. Yes, yeah. 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 Thank you for your very nice talk. I am no uh, such in such any questions, but uh, I really observed that for uh, including uh, harder interactions for three body and four body, most of the cases the systems are be, uh, make very multi stability. Mix multiple and the basis of attraction is very small in size, and most of the cases, some uh, systems go beyond their uh, boundary state. That is, most of the times they are uh, go to infinity. Uh, I don't know whether uh, uh, sometimes the three body interaction are, uh, gives better results. When you include four body interactions, the systems not gives the better results. I think I hope to have understood your question. First of all, the issue of multi stability. Evidently, the fact that you int introduce uh, multi body interaction may give rise to different, uh, as you see, dynamics, and uh, you can certainly have uh, uh, richer um, components, so multi stable dynamics, and so on and so forth. As a matter of fact, we did not yet investigate in depth this issue and i think it's a very interesting point to be investigated on the sides um, we have the results i have shown to you correspond to the numerical results to networks of sufficiently large sites and we have verified that when you increase the size or decrease the size there is a sufficiently wide range where you don't change qualitatively the scenario and the case of synchronization i mean the master stability function as well as the uh, case of kuramoto we have provided a rigorous theory so this is uh, in a sense independent of the size because uh, the, the theory has been proven rigorously for any size no, for, for phase oscillator is fine, but for amplitude oscillators, that is Rusla rod, uh, Rusla rod, Lorenz oscillators, sometimes for Rusla oscillator, I, I, I tell you, for Rusla oscillator, yeah, for Rusla oscillator, what I I show you is that when you couple them non-linearly, you have different property of synchronization. So uh, this means that uh, given the same structure of network depending on how you couple them you may have stability or instability of the synchronization and this in principle i repeat is independent on the sites because it's a rigorous result of course it's a rigorous result uh, which start from the assumption that all the oscillators are equal so you have to take all oscillators to be identical yes Thank you. Thank you, Divakar. Yes. All the questions? Yes. Are there, are there more questions?
or any clarifications? No. Okay, if there are no questions or clarifications, so uh, I thank you really for the patience and attention you gave me, the opportunity to speak to you. Please uh, consult uh, our papers, and if you have any doubt, any suggestion, any request for further clarification, don't hesitate to write me. Uh, my email, uh, I think it's very easy because it's my name, Stefano, dot my surname, Boccaletti, at gmail.com. So it's very, very simple. <laughs> you can contact me anytime. Okay. It okay. was a pleasure for me to stay with you. Uh, thank you a lot. Thank you very much, Professor, uh, for accepting our invitation and delivering a very wonderful lecture in this lecture series. I will write to you for other details. Thank you. Thank you a lot. I have to leave you because, as you say, during the lecture, I was phoned by the rector of my university and I need to speak with him as soon as possible. Okay. okay. Bye. Okay, bye. Ciao. Bye.